Welcome to the Jill on Money Show. It's Friday, April 28th, and we are here answering financial questions for you. And uh, if you'd like, uh, we get so many questions about real estate, and we just got uh, some new real estate data in, but I did a big blog post about what's going on with housing affordability. Mark, weren't some of those numbers shocking about the affordability in just three years? So if you look back at 2020, housing affordability was actually pretty good. We compare the um, amount of costs that are associated with carrying a home to median household income, and if it's below 30%, it's considered affordable. So literally January 2020, housing affordability is at, let's call it 28.5%. And then three years later, it jumps over 38%. That is why people are so freaked out about the real estate market. I feel so weird when people are like, I have to buy a house. I'm like, why? Do you have to? I mean, if you do have to, fine. And uh, Mark told me a story about friends of his who just, you know, they got a mortgage and they're like, well, whatever, it's it's high. Now we'll refinance, which is also fine. You can use an adjustable rate mortgage. But if you are either in the market to buy a home or sell a home, we'd love to hear from you. You should read the blog post first and then give us a holler. Go to JillOnMoney.com, click the Contact Us button. I'm really interested in hearing these stories about what people are doing, whether they're just hanging on the sidelines or whether people are willing to actually list their homes and do something else. Very, very interested in this. All right. So today we are going to do some emails because it's been a while. So yesterday and today email episodes. This is from Lynn, who is 47 years old. Um, I'm single, no kids. I uh, work in healthcare. I earn $215,000, live on the West Coast. I've got two homes. The primary mortgage, the primary house is worth three hundred fifteen grand. has a 245000 30-year fixed rate mortgage, 2.875%. The rental property, oh my God, $800,000 with a $120,000 rental property balance on, their mor- on that mortgage, 15 years, eight years to go. I wish that were flipped. I wish we had 30 years on that one. Okay. $384,000 in a pre-tax retirement, rollover, Roth, 30 grand, two non-retirement brokerage accounts, almost a half a million dollars. I'm maxing out my workplace retirement plan. I was using a Roth 403B. I changed it to a regular. I've got an employer match. Um, So here are the questions. I was late to the Roth until I kept hearing Mark advocating for it. So I started a few years ago, but I switched to a regular 403B because I had to pay $7,000 in taxes. So I thought that could help with my 2023 tax. Should I not have? The employer 403B plan is at principal and the only good fund I see so far is the S&P 500. (laughs) Mark, should she have not switched to pay her tax bill? Uh, I would say that was a mistake. Uh, Maybe change your withholdings at work. Uh, You know, maybe you're not having enough withheld, but she's young. She has a lot of money already. I I would start doing the Roth now. And she has a lot of money pre-tax retirement balance right now that's like kind of feels like almost like fine and manageable, but it could get so compounded over the next 20 years if she keeps putting money away in pre-tax. So she's investing four grand into her investment accounts and she wants to know, should I do $4,000 once a month, spread it out? Eh, doesn't matter. Wherever, whatever works for your cash flow. I think four grand a month or a thousand dollars a week is amazing. Can you imagine that, Mark? Boom, a thousand dollars a week. It's a very good savings rate. She says, I count my non retirement account as part of my overall retirement. Am I on track at, of, for retiring at a normal age of 65? Could I retire a little early at 60? Yeah, of course. You're, you're like absolutely killing it. Um, Should I max out 403B and contribute only up to the match? And I I think you're going to have to, listen, this is what I would do. In terms of investing, I think I would use the 403B. Use, you can put all the money in the, in, you can just basically go crazy and say, put it all in the S&P 500 for all I care and use the other investment account to maybe invest in other asset classes, right? That way you're actually using the best of your employer 403B and you're using everything else for your other investing. One thing I would actually really think would be helpful for you in terms of managing your tax liability is inside of your non-retirement brokerage account at Vanguard, what about using 
a California municipal bond fund. Maybe you can use that as a fixed income product for yourself, manage the actual tax liability. You can do that right at Vanguard. So I think that would be worth it. Oh, this is funny. Can I buy a new car? Mark, can she buy a new car? (laughs) Yeah, she can afford to buy a new car. She also asked if she should keep or sell the rental. I know this is interesting. I was saving that for the last thing. Okay. So here's the question about the rental that I have for you. Right now, you have an $800,000 property with only a $120,000 mortgage, and there's only eight years to go on that mortgage. That, that You have a ton of equity in that home, and if the only thing that that home is doing is paying your mortgage with somewhat positive cash flow, you didn't say by how much. I need to know whether that, that rental property is working for you. I think in my mind, if you don't like having the rental property, you can sell that, pop the money into the investment account. You can do whatever you want. Then you're certainly on track to be able to retire by age 60. I mean, I think you're probably on track anyway, but I need to know details about this mortgage, about this, uh, this rental property. How is it working? What is it generating? This is really important. Bianca says... When you and Mark talk about estate documents, what are those exact documents? I understand the need for a will, a power of attorney, and advanced health care directive. But does everyone need a revocable trust? Bianca gave us a, a link to an article on nolo.com about a living trust. She says, it seems that we fit the case of not needing a living trust at this moment. So let's find out about Bianca. She's 40, husband's 45. Their wishes are simple. We plan on leaving everything to each other if one of us passes before the other. And when we both pass, everything goes to my stepson. He's currently 22, no other children. We are of those typical means, meaning we've got about a current balance of $450,000 for both of us in retirement accounts and emergency funds, including excluding the house value of $300,000. We don't own a small business where we're W-2 workers. Am I missing something? No, you don't need that. A revocable trust, a changeable trust is very good for conveying assets when there is a complication, a small business, a bust out kid, uh, an obligation to someone else. You don't need it. I mean, the especially, especially when you have mostly retirement accounts. And as Mark and I have been talking about this more and more, check with your bank, check if you have, if you happen to have a brokerage account, there are many people now who have the ability to actually have a transfer on death account. And that is wonderful for non-retirement assets to be able to pass more seamlessly to your heirs. So I would encourage everyone to Talk to their local bank, wherever they're keeping their money, or go online and see if a transfer on death is an option for your non-retirement accounts. Um, This is from Kevin, who says, thank you for publishing your articles. I read your column in the Chicago Tribune. Okay, question. Should the U.S. Congress not pass a bill to raise the debt limit and default occurs, how would it infect, <laughs> infect, how would it affect individuals holding T-bills and T-bonds maturing between July and December of 23? Will interest not be paid? Delayed payments? Lower interest paid? Kevin, great question. The answer to the question is that there are other measures that the uh, government would likely take before they stop paying interest on bills and bonds, because that would essentially be a technical default, and it would be a cluster you-know-what for the government. Um, So what's likely to happen before that time is furloughs, where they would hold back. They might say to people, like, don't come into work. Um, They would basically say to people who are essential, you're going to work, but we're not paying you. But there's a whole lot. I think there's a whole host of other measures that would occur before bills or bonds would be impacted. And I don't think that there's really any plan for that. I'm sure that the that the Treasury has a uh, break the glass plan. But, you know, what you really need to know is that if the situation were to escalate, to such a point where they are not paying you your interest. My guess is that it would be a short-lived experience. The markets would get rocked. Congress would get spooked. They'd come back. They'd make the deal. And whatever interest you're owed would be paid eventually. I think that's probably a pretty good bet. 
Bruce writes, does it make sense to sell some brokerage bond mutual funds that are down around 5% for the past year and put the proceeds in a one-year 5% CD? I could recoup my losses, eliminate some market risk exposure in these uncertain times when the market gets back to normal and savings rates drop, I can jump back into the market. I'm 72 and retired. Bruce, I bet that you never would imagine that many people have thought that very same thing. The problem with your your philosophy is I don't know when the market gets back to normal. I don't know what's going to happen. And what's likely more likely to occur is that by selling out of those bond mutual funds that are down, right, you lock in the loss. And as they come back, as prices start to increase, you are not enjoying the actual ride back up. You're stuck in your CD. And then at that moment, when the CDs, after they're maturing, what ends up happening is you're stuck having to buy back into the bond mutual fund after they've already recovered a lot of those losses. That said, is there some money in there that you just say, I'm never putting back in the bond market, then you could use CDs. But just know that there is interest rate risk in that what you're going to say is I'll put the money in for 5% now, but in a year, the rate might be 3%. And so what I think makes more sense is to really look at the amount of risk you have in the overall portfolio, determine what you want in or out of those mutual funds, and you know stick to your game plan. Try not to time the market because that's exactly what you're asking. You know, when you write a a statement like this and everyone listening, you know, I know we've all thought it when it gets back to normal. I don't know when that when is. It's so difficult to project. This last email is from Teresa who wants to know how do you cancel life insurance? Ah, okay. So here's the thing. Before you cancel an insurance policy, there are some questions that are always worth asking the insurance company. Number one, is there a tax event if I cancel this insurance policy? That would be the type of insurance that has a death benefit. I don't, I'm not saying you shouldn't get rid of the policy it, you know, because of the tax event. It's just that I want to know what it is. When you cancel an insurance policy that has cash value, the determination as to whether or not you pay taxes is based on how much money you put into the policy and what it's worth. If you put money into the policy, let's say you put $15,000 into the policy, the cash value is $30,000. The difference between what you put in, the cost basis, and the cash value that you get out, the $30,000, that $15,000 is taxed as ordinary income, okay? So before you cancel any policies, Teresa, do me a favor, find out whether or not you have any tax hit that's coming And if you do, then just make sure you set aside the right amount of money. And before you give up that policy, just make sure you really don't need it because um, it's tough to get it when you do need it. Okay. Uh, I think that's it, my friends. It is Friday. And that means that we are going to do some business. Our music is composed by Joel Goodman. Karen Kranick is our web queen. Mark Talercio is our executive producer. And we are distributed by Cadence 13. All right, don't forget, on the website, all sorts of great stuff. You got the book, The Great Money Reset, our Jill on Money Live, our quarterly webinar series, and new extra content that's going up there. So check out our Jill on Money Live, our next webinar coming up in June with Dave Stahoviak, host and founder of Coaching for Leaders. He is a a management guru and a great guy. So uh, check that out. Love to have you join us. Do something nice for someone else today. It's going to make that person feel better. It will make you feel better. Change your work, change your wealth, change your life. Thanks for listening. We'll talk to you tomorrow. Tomorrow.